did these guys even read the email before they started spamming their audience? Look at it. It's a joke. Over the next couple of videos, I'm gonna cover some easy wins that you can do right now that will take your marketing forward in 2021. And, and when I say forward, I really mean as far away as possible from 2020. Welcome to Nanobytes, the channel all about leveling up your digital skills to become a heavyweight all-rounder, helping you and your business grow. In this four-part series, I'm gonna be covering the usual suspects, that you would find in any good marketeer's arsenal. Now, I'm not gonna go in depth into each one, but what I will show you is some really easy wins that you can start implementing right now that will really have a massive impact on your marketing. The difference with this one is I'm gonna show you real life examples that work, and I'll also throw in some real schoolboy errors from some big brands that you'd be surprised they made. Plus, as a delicious side dish, not sure about that phrase, but as an extra or a bonus with each episode, I have created some templates that you can use to make your marketing activities that much easier. And when I say templates, I don't just mean an Excel sheet or a downloadable Word document. I mean smart templates that are live and interactive that you can push buttons and automated things happen. So if you're interested in those, do stick around until the end or skip ahead. I've put chapters in down below, but stick around to the end to see how to use the templates. Otherwise, you will be as confused as seeing your grandma twerking on TikTok. I was very confused. So let's kick off along the lines of something that you're already doing, email marketing. But in this episode, we're gonna focus on one aspect of email marketing. We're gonna focus on hyper-personalization or deep personalization, whichever turn of phrase you like the sound of. It might surprise you that email marketing is still probably the best marketing channel out there in terms of ROI. Brands are doing really exciting things with email at the moment. They are trying to squeeze every single drop of goodness they can out of email because it is such an effective marketing platform. And if you don't believe me, Shut up, Rory. Email's dead, along with your acting career. Ouch. If you don't believe me, email is very much alive and kicking. Just take a look at the stats on screen now. It's pretty staggering. From a tech side, there's, there's definitely some great workarounds there. And also, readership is increasing. Just take a look at Twitter's acquisition of Review. Review? Review? I don't know how you say that. Review. 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 I'm going to go with review. They acquired it for some undisclosed sum, and it's a newsletter publishing platform. So more and more people are going back to newsletters and their email inbox after sort of the veneer of the shiny and new has worn off of social ads, and people are a little bit sick and tired of social, and they're going back to their, their trusty inbox. This episode is all about personalization or hyper-personalization, and a core component of that is segmentation. Well, what is segmentation? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I will use my trusty Swedish horses to explain. <laughs> segmentation, very simply, is the process of categorizing your subscribers or your customers into groups that makes sense based on the data you have about them. So for instance, you might have a thousand customers that always open their emails in the evening between the hours of six and eight, and they really like products that are red. My imagination isn't great right now. Uh, it's early in the morning. And then you might have another set of customers that uh, always read their emails in the morning. They're all based in a similar geo location, like let's say London, for example, and they only buy trainers from your online store. So you put them in another category. You can be as granular as you like with this and you have many, many different categories, many, many different types of segmentation and you can really have fun with it. It's better to be leaning more towards the granular niching downside than it is to be too broad stroke with your email because the more personalized and specific it is, the better it is for you. For example, 70% of millennials don't want to see newsletters or emails to them that aren't relevant, that the content doesn't make sense. And I would say, and I would argue that that number is probably a lot higher. Who wants to receive stuff that isn't relevant to them, that doesn't make sense to them? So it's really, really important to look at segmentation as a whole. So what are some examples of segmentation? Well, let's take a look at that. Let me put my horses back. I'll see if I can put them in the same place for continuity purposes. 
otherwise you'll know when I've made cuts. But I'm sure, I'm sure that looks good. So segmenting has two primary benefits. Number one, it as I said, it allows you to personalize content on a very granular level. And number two, it allows you to test the hell out of your emails. You can test everything. You can test your subject line, intro, body copy, lead-in copy, images, footer, the content, who you send it to, what time you send it to, the tone of the email. You, you can pretty much customize anything to your heart's content. So it's really fantastic for personalization and for split testing. Now you might say, hey Rory, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is all old news, what are you talking about? Well, yes, some of you might already be doing segmentation and that's fantastic if you are, but what I'm covering here isn't just standard segmentation, I'm talking about hyper-personalized segmentation or deep personalization, whichever phrase you prefer. And the goal here with hyper-personalization is to build the most engaging, personalized, crafted content you can for your audience. So how do we establish if we are personalizing our content to a deep enough level? How do we establish if we're doing it in the right way? The High Five Impact Check is a protocol I developed for my clients to very quickly and easily assess, are they personalizing to a deep enough level? and have they missed anything out? And it's just a quick checklist that you can run every time you're about to send a campaign. Number one, really simply, are we using their name? Now you might say, hey, right, that's dumb. We all know this stuff. It's, now, of course, yeah, it's super simple. It's really obvious, but wow, is it powerful when you use your subscriber's name in the subject line. It has a huge impact. We are talking an increase of up to 30% open rates when you use their name. You might already be doing that. What the check does is it asks you, are we using it in, a, in the right way and is it necessary? Because personalization isn't always about, okay, we've got their name on the database, let's cram their name in, hey, here's your name. 20 times. It's not just about that. It's about, does it make sense to use their name in the context? So for instance, instead of saying, Rory, Here's an offer for you. Here's an offer just for you, Rory. It might sound simple and, and pretty stupid, uh, but just switching it up like that has a really, really big impact. And if you're increasing it by 30%, having them open the email, they're up to 45% more likely to engage with the content as well. So we're talking really big numbers here that have, that have a massive impact on your engagement and open rates with your emails just by adding their name. So number one, use their name if it makes sense. Number two of the personalization. Number two of the personalization markers. Are we using their name in the lead-in copy? Are we referencing them? Who are we addressing it to? How are we addressing them? If it's just a standard newsletter, yeah, it might make sense to address them. Or if it's a statement, it depends how we want this content to be read. If we're just shouting at them, does it make sense to? to I mean. Or if you are sending emails, marketing emails, don't shout at your subscribers. There's, there's, a, there's a free tip. <laughs> Nobody likes to be shouted at. And, and many brands do do this. They sort of just spam their, their subscribers and like, new offer for you, new offer. Um, so try and make it feel more personalized to them with a lead-in copy. And if you have the ability, uh, you have either internal design team or you have an agency making uh, creative for you, do try and personalize the image content. So don't just send all your subscribers the exact same lead-in image. Try and see if you can make a, a set of different lead-in images that are more related to your uh, segmentation groups. Number three is contextually relevant or contextually aware emails. Now this simply means if you have a good amount of data, and I, I hope you do, I hope you've been doing a stand-up job of collecting data on your, on your customers. If you haven't, this isn't going to work so well for you. But if you have, what you're able to do is able to look at things like demographic and psychometric data, age, location, uh, gender, that kind of thing, uh, interests, if you have it, apply that in your emails. Let's take a look at an example and see how that, that works in real life practice. So I have um, one of the emails that we typically send uh, here at Runaway. And what I wanna do is I wanna show you an email without any personalization whatsoever, and then an email with personalization and see how different they feel. So the copy is, is relatively the same, but we're able to add in punctuation points that really emphasize that we're talking directly to them. So let's, let's take a look at those now. So we send out a bunch of different trigger uh, and transactional emails. If we didn't do any personalization, this is what it would look like. So we have our lead in copy and title. So, hey, happy anniversary. It's been an epic journey since we first started working together. 
Um, wow, what a journey. Thank you so much for choosing to partner with Runaway. We've had a blast working on your projects. It's been a privilege and we want to help you grow. Here's our appreciation. Here's 15% off. So it's okay. It's fine. It's, it's, it's just a, uh, an offer email. Nothing special, nothing exciting. Let's take a look at what it looks like when we personalize that. So immediately it's, it's pretty different. We have a animated GIF that is relevant to our target audience member that we're sending it to. So we know what gender they are, we know roughly what age they are, we know what their interests are. So for instance, this is an example of a client of ours that is really into golf. They're a big golf fan. So we're using a golf image. Now again, you might not always have this type of granular data about your, your clients or your subscribers or your customers, but if you do, Wow, it makes such a big difference. So we have a customized uh, GIF lead in that's relevant to the person we're sending it to. We have their name in the copy. Hey Annie, happy anniversary. So we're using their name straight away. It's been an epic 365 days since we started working on this project. Now we have their start date of when they started working on projects with us. That metadata is then pulled in to the email. So that's already really personalized. The following copy goes, thank you so much for working with Runaway. We've had a blast working on your rebrand project. We have a, a, a drop down list of sort of the, the projects we tend to work on. Um, they're pretty broad, but what we do is we add that to each client when we start a project on them and it takes the most recent project and it puts it in there. So immediately we're talking about what we've just worked on with them and we address them. Um, we hope you enjoyed working on it, blah, blah, blah. It's been a privilege to work with you and help you grow Chocolate 21. Again, we're naming their business here. We didn't do that last time. We just said working on your brand. Here's 21% off your next month's subscription. Click here to activate. It's completely different and it feels so tailored to them. It feels so bespoke to them. It reads like we've actually written it. We care about them, but we haven't, ha ha. Um, I'm sorry for clients watching this uh, and now you're seeing that we don't actually write these emails. <laughs> the difference we see when we, when we personalize these emails and when we don't, is just huge. And we do this for a lot of our other emails. So that's an example of hyper-personalization for point number three. Moving on. So number four is following on from the theme of, of contextually relevant is history. What do we know about them transactionally? What do we know about their buying behavior? Now this number four is, is very closely related to e-commerce brands and online stores. That's mainly what we work with at Runaway. So it, it, it might not be quite relevant for your brand uh, if you are not a transactional, if you're not an e-commerce brand, but it's still pretty interesting in any case. So what number four is about is all about their buying history, their purchasing history. So what's their average order value? What's the products they tend to look at? What's their cart abandonment rate? How many times do they put stuff in the basket and leave before they then make a purchase? So we take all that data and then we start tailoring really custom emails to them to try and get them over the line to purchase more of those products or to purchase products that they've been thinking about for a while. So what a lot of brands do with cart abandonment is they just say, you left something in your basket. So instead of just saying you left something in your basket, what we try and do is we try and say product benefits about that email. So rather than just sending them a quick email with their basket and then a summary, we send them some information about that product, more reasons to, to buy that product, uh, reasons to believe in purchasing that product, which has a huge impact on conversions. We don't tend to do sneaky things that some brands do. Um, so something that uh, one brand that I really like and I love the playfulness of their emails is a brand called Low High Low. Uh, they're a Swedish uh, brand. They make mainly sort of low calorie uh, or low carb ice creams and, and uh, drinks and things like that. What they will do is, is they will send an email, the car abandonment email will say order conf dot dot dot. Ooh, that's a bit naughty, because uh, that sets a bit of panic in the customer and they go, oh, did I order it? I thought I didn't order it. Uh, and that can, can leave a little bit of bitterness in there. So be a little bit careful about your subject lines and, and don't be too naughty or cheeky. You can be, you can be fun, um, but I, I wouldn't be disingenuous. And I think that, that reads a little bit disingenuous. So let's continue on with, with the anniversary theme and let's look at how some brands take history into account and use that to their advantage. One of my favorites, and you've probably seen this already, it's done the rounds many, many times, 
uh, across the web is the EasyJet email. It's really aesthetically pleasing, it's very simply laid out, but it takes a huge amount of data and it lays it out in lovely fashion. So it shows you how many miles you've traveled, well, probably not so good for climate change, but it shows you how many miles you've traveled and how many locations you visited and, and when you did that. Then what they do is something quite fun. They look at other destinations that their customers typically go on. They use that data set as a recommendation engine to say, look, here are some locations that our other customers have been on. You might like these. So really, really cool. Although totally irrelevant now, we're, we're in a, a lockdown and, and air travel is is pretty much a no-go but still a great email and finally number five and you'll notice there's a theme here is the content relevant to them is there a point in sending this email and you might say well isn't this just the same as all the others well the difference here is it's a final validation to say should we send this campaign to this segmented audience because what a lot of brands tend to do is they will take a theme like veganuary or valentine's day and they will just send it to all their subscribers. And I get that, there's pressure from the management teams and, and, and uh, marketing head office to say, we just gotta send it to everybody, just get it out there, send it to everybody. It can feel like that sometimes, but that's not always the best approach. And in fact, it's usually not the best approach because it's always better to try and segment your emails out. There is no point sending a big veganuary email campaign to a large group of subscribers that have no interest in vegan products, have no interest in buying them from you, and probably never will. If you look at their buying habits and they always buy non-vegan products, you can see that they don't even browse it, they're not interested in it. Don't send it to them because it's not relevant to them. Now, again, you can say, yeah, but they might be trying it out for the year, fine. But what you don't want to do when you send these big broad stroke email campaigns is alienate any of your subscribers because too many brands focus on acquiring more subscribers. We need to up our subscriber count. We need more subscribers. And that's fine, that's great. But it's so much more important to retain your current subscribers because what you don't want to do is add five new subscribers every week and lose a hundred. That just doesn't make sense. It's It's an unwinnable game. So what you want to try and do is always make sure is the content that we're sending to our current subscribers relevant? It's fine to send stuff to your new subscribers, you don't know about them, you don't have the data, but if you've got the data, don't be lazy, take a look and see, is it relevant to them? So that personalization checklist should really help you determine every single time, is the content relevant? Is it gonna get me the maximum impact that I want? Now, as I said, it's not relevant for every single email campaign you send, and it's certainly not relevant for, for just broad stroke newsletters or news announcements that you're gonna send, but it's really, really hyper relevant for transactional or trigger or automated, uh, automated email campaigns that you're gonna send on a regular basis. So it's really, really handy and really useful for those instances. We're all familiar with newsletters, but now let's move on to the other type of automated campaign campaigns or transactional or trigger emails that you might have seen before. Now, one of the best is welcome emails or onboarding emails because the customer or the subscriber is expecting them. And they have, well, when I say expecting them, they, they are expecting them, but they're not sitting waiting. And I know many brands forget about this. Many brands are like, we need to send the emails. They're waiting for them. They're expecting them. No matter how big or cool you are as a brand, nobody's sitting looking at their inbox, waiting for your email. It's just not gonna happen. They're expecting some sort of welcome email from you. And this is where you're gonna see sky high open rates. We're talking 50% open rates. Of those 50% that open it, a third of them are gonna engage or, or interact with your content in some way, whether it's click-through rate uh, or saving it for later, they're gonna engage with that content. That's huge, that's phenomenal. So what we want to do is not waste this opportunity. Surprisingly, so many brands just mess this up. They do a terrible job. They just go, Thanks for subscribing to our newsletter. Thanks for signing up. Shop now. Just really, really lazy stuff. Look at this. This is horrendous. This is a big brand and they're just sending garbage welcome emails. That's awful. That, that doesn't make me feel like I'm a part of a community or I'm not excited to shop with you or, or to read more of your stuff. That's rubbish. What are some examples of really good welcome emails? Now, I'm gonna rate these emails in bananas. If you haven't seen my previous review videos, I tend to use bananas. Let's take a look at the first one, ASOS. Now, amazingly, it's a brilliant looking email. It's, it's one of my favorites. It doesn't use any personalization. Doesn't mean it's a bad email. Just means that they've missed out a little bit of really pushing up that personalization level, turning it up to 11. They haven't really done it, but 
looking at the email from an aesthetic point of view, from an engagement, from a reason to believe point of view, it's fantastic. Let's take a quick look. So first of all, we have the subject line, welcome to the family. Oh, I love it. There's just some celebration emojis. That's brilliant. That's fun. Makes me want to open it. I open it up. It would have been nice to see welcome to the family, Rory, but hey ho, it's okay. First of all, we have uh, the header here. So they've got some quick call to action for where to go on their site for shopping. Now again, a little bit disappointed here. I would have liked to have seen this customized to me. So instead of saying dresses, it would have been nice to have said, I don't know, men's shirts or, or whatever, something a bit more specific to me, but that's okay, that's fine. We'll let that slide because the rest of the email is just brilliant. So we have a fantastic header image here. It's official uh, with a couple together, making it like we're in a relationship. So I already know where this is going. And then we've got the lead-in copy. Again, to use my name here, that would have been a little bit more engaging, but that's okay. The lead-in copy is, looks like things are getting serious between us. And that's a great thing, because that means you'll forever be updated on all things ASOS. That's great, it's really relaxed, colloquial terminology here, cause take a peek below at some of the reasons uh, of shopping with us. So straight away, they're going into the, the benefits here or the reasons to, to believe in the brand or just go straight to the site, you do you. Oh, it's giving me choices already, fantastic. So we've got a call to action here, get shopping. Again, they've changed up the verbiage here. They're not using just shop now. Then we've got a nice little um, design element here. So instead of just using a standard divider, they've used a little uh, swish or, or a, um, a wave. These are really popular at the moment doesn't mean everybody should do them, but it's a really nice breaker between the content. Um, and they've used really big, strong blocks of color here, which just makes it really, really nice and fun to read. They've got an animated GIF here. It's not too fast, and it's just showing me all the different styles and designs they do. ASOS exclusives, cool. I go down, one-stop shop, great. Tells me all about all the brands that they do. Join the party, it's encouraging me to sign up uh, or follow them on social and the reasons why, um, because I'll, I'll get further inspiration. So it's giving me reasons and upon reasons of why I need to shop with ASOS. And then the best part down here is three reasons to shop. Straight away, it's giving me the reasons to believe. So I don't have time for objections and going, ah, oh, I don't wanna shop yet. It's giving me all these options. So look at that, um, nothing new here, payments, free delivery and returns, the ASOS app, but the way it's laid out is really engaging. It's really fantastic. I, I think it would have been nice to have seen a bit more personalization here, but overall the design, aesthetics and layout is really, really well done. They haven't been lazy and just done thanks for signing up. They've made it engaging for me. So overall, I think it's really, really good. Two bananas from me. Uh, would have liked to have given it three, but hey ho, really, really good. Let's take a look at the next example. This is from MyProtein, huge, huge sports brand. Now, aesthetically, it's not great looking. It's pretty weak. Disappointed overall. It's got an okay call to action. Welcome to my protein. It would have been nice to have seen a bit more engaging subject line. So the start of your new journey, something like that. And again, personalization would have, would have really gone down well here. A header here, bestsellers, protein, clothing, vegan app. But again, it doesn't, it's not really pushing me towards anything. There's no direction here. Then we've got a big block of text. Now this isn't live text, so I'm disappointed here. Um, the ASOS one wasn't live text in the header either. Live text just means real text that you can you can click and select. It, this is image-based text, so it's text inside an image, which can sort of crush your image aesthetic and, and make it not look so good because you have to squash the size of it so it won't be hyper detailed here. It's always best to try and use big, bold live text when you can for headings because they just translate much better and they're responsive, so they will change size depending on the size of your email. Then it's just a big dark Im image of a dude in the middle. I don't know what they're doing with this concrete uh, sort of background. It's just messy, it doesn't look very good. It's not very clean at all. And then thank you. So we've got thank you for signing up and then thank you again. Pretty poor, not a great welcome email. Thank you for signing up to our emails. You'll enjoy benefits like exclusive discounts, access to our biggest sales, and even nutrition content tailored to your fitness journey. There is, ooh, this bit of personalization there. They really missed an opportunity here because they allude to, could do content tailored to me. Well, why didn't you do it here? So they should have started the email saying, thanks for signing up, and then what's your interest? Are you trying to lose weight? Are you trying to build muscle? They do have that on the site. So they could have just replicated that information in the welcome email, and it would have made a huge difference to this static, bland welcome email that we've got. Compare that back to the ASOS email that didn't have personalization, but it felt much more personable. It felt much more friendly. Now, some of that's to do with the brand tone of voice. Um, again, we've got a different tone of voice here. It's a little bit more serious uh, about fitness, but 
they could have had a bit more fun with it and they definitely could have done more to entice me and engage me. And then the call to action button, make your first order now. Mm, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't really make me want to. There's no reasons to believe in the brand, nothing here. Pretty boring, uh, pretty crap. So I'm gonna give that one banana out of three. Missed opportunity here. Let's take a look at the next email. This one is great. It does a really fantastic job. Uh, this one is from Medium Daily Digest. It's just a uh, publishing site, it's a blog site essentially where people can publish articles. There's lots of really great content on there. If you haven't been on there, definitely go check it out. The subject line, personalized. So already we're off to a great start. Welcome to Medium, Rory Knighton. Lovely. I mean, I don't think they need to use my whole name, but okay. Sounds a little bit formal. And then we go in your Medium Daily Digest. Now already the aesthetics of this are really nice because it matches beautifully with the main site. And that's a, a key thing here is consistency. What you don't want to do is send really freaky looking emails or crazy looking emails and then your site is really bland or vice versa. There's a consistency there that really makes the whole experience feel so much more cohesive. And that's what a lot of brands are doing now. They're trying to find ways that we can they can make their emails really hyper branded that makes sense when you click through and you go on landing page that also matches and is consistent. So really nice consistency here. The subheading underneath Medium Daily Digest says stories for Rory Knighton. Now I really like that. It's immediately telling me it's it's for me. It's made for me. How special am I? Um, God, I sound like such a narcissist. But as humans, we like to see that. We, we like it when people say our name. So look, we're already three levels in deep personalization. We've got our name in the subject line. We've got our name uh, in the subheader saying that it's stories made for me. And then in the lead in copy, we've got my name again. So it's doing a fantastic job here. And then we've got the digest is your personalized reading list of stories based on your interests as feature stories selected by medium editors. So it feels already really personalized. So it's telling me that it's, it's curated and personalized to what I like, fantastic. And then we go down, we've got the highlights, um, stuff that I'm gonna be interested in, really nice, clean, nothing fancy layout, but it doesn't need to be. Um, and then the editor's picks, um, really fantastic. And then at the bottom, fantastic call to action, make this email better. Oof, I like that, that's lovely. And then call to action button isn't, do it now or, or read more or learn more. It's tailor your topics. Perfect, I know exactly what that button's gonna do. I know where it's gonna take me. Beautiful. Uh, and then we've got a call to action to go to their app. So overall, really, really good, really clean, really simple, very well personalized. That ticks all the boxes for me. That is three bananas. So I hope you saw some good examples there of, of personalizing with real metadata and how you can still personalize without any metadata whatsoever. The ASOS example shows you that you can still feel a connection with the brand. It can still feel engaging and fun and a little bit personal without actually using any of the data that they have about you. There are some really basic keys to designing great emails that they should always follow. So let's take a look at some of those now. Number one, measure. Do not send your customers big, long chunks of text. Nobody wants to receive big, long chunks of text in their email. Not from their colleagues at work, not from their crazed ex-partner, and certainly not from brands. Keep it short, simple, and concise, and keep it impactful. Think about how you can, you can word it in the shortest amount of words and still get your point across. My favorite reference is always Abraham Lincoln. If he could get his Gettysburg address down to 250 words, the end of the Civil War, I'm sure you can get your marketing email down a few words more than that. Number two, create some enticing vernacular. So create some verbiage that really connects and makes sense and don't just use the standard learn more. You know, it's, it's boring. And what happens is you get the banner blindness. People are blind to these sort of links and labels. They're just not interesting. They're not engaging. So look at switching that up and using something instead of learn more, start exploring. Instead of shop now, like ASOS, get shopping. Just do something a little bit different, a little bit more engaging and make it fun. Number three, if you're gonna add animation, try and keep the file size small and try and keep the animations relatively smooth and simple and not too long. Nobody wants to see big flashing banners. It's just not pleasant to open up. So try and keep it subtle, a little bit like the ASOS example, really good uh, example of, of some, some smooth GIFs. I'll throw up a few more on screen that are just gentle and just subtle. And the, the more simple the animation is and, and the more subtle it is, the so much more impactful than throwing up loads of different images and flashing things really, really fast. Keep it human. 
add some interest, add some intrigue, add something different, something funny. As long as it's sort of closely related to or on brand, add something to your email. So at the bottom of the email, add a funny quote every time or add a story every time or add some interesting links or add something different to your email to keep it interesting and engaging and to add in that that uh, element of intrigue and, and keep it human, keep it fun because we're all humans at the end of the day. We're not automatons, we're not robots. Well, some of us are, <laughs> but try and keep it, try and keep it fun and, and light. So those are some guides that should help you along on your journey to creating more engaging, more impactful content with a relative ease. You don't need to think about big, huge strategies when you're doing this. You just need to say, is the content relevant? Is it human? And are we making it personalized enough to our audience? So that's just a really simple thing. Why didn't I just say that? I've just spent all this time talking about the video. I could have just sent that sentence. So hopefully uh, that helps. Now I did mention earlier on, I had a template that you could use. So let's take a quick look at that and see how that works in action. So the template is on Trello. Now, if you don't know what Trello is or anything about it, I've got tons of video on all things Trello. It's simply just a Kanban board or a digital whiteboard, if you like. It's a, a free piece of software or free app that you can you can get right now. You don't have to pay for it. It's completely free. Uh, and it does some really fun, useful things. So let's dive in here. Um, now, this is an email planning template and it's laid out pretty simply. Um, these things are called lists, if you don't know what they are. And each list has something called cards. Now, I've put a couple different emails in, in the design inspiration column just for you to have a look at, but really it's for you to use yourself. So all you do is you, you click this big green button here that says create board from template. So you create your own board that copies all this content and then you can start populating it with emails that you think are inspiring or that you like for inspiration. And then the next uh, list is called ideation topics. Now ideation is just a silly word that, that I use for coming up with ideas or brainstorming. If you want any sort of ideas on, on how I do that or what that process looks like, I've got another video, I'll post that somewhere up here, where you can follow along uh, my process for coming up with ideas. So we've got ideation topics, then we've got planning. Now I did say this was a smart template and I'm going to show you now. So for instance, um, in the planning, now you might send them every week, you might send them every month, you might send them annually or whatever it is. So name, name them whatever you want. But for instance, I'm going to do one here. Let's call it February. We'll add that now. And with February, we can open up the card and then inside it's got some custom fields. Now we can start populating February with some content. Um, uh, we can start saying what it's going to be about, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And um, what I've created here are some custom buttons. Now on the right hand side, we have a button called start drafting. If we click that button, it'll close the card. It'll add a fun little rocket sticker to it. It will change the name from just the name of the, the, the month to drafting. Uh, and then it'll also change the status to in progress. And it'll move it to the column called drafting which is pretty handy. And what it also does is adds a comment so that everybody following the board, if you have multiple team members, they can see you've started drafting the February newsletter and it requests content. So whoever else is involved in your team can see that and they can start adding content to it. So that takes a lot of the stress and pressure out because you don't need to start emailing everybody or messaging people. I've started working on the newsletter. Please can you send me content? Um, it's pretty useful. It's pretty handy. It saves a lot of our clients a huge amount of time. Then inside this drafting, we've got the copy broken down into what your intro copy is going to be, your summary and your article copy. And then we've got the creative broken down into cover, taste breaker, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And then over on the next column, we've got A-B testing. So this is where you can populate it with things that you want to A-B or split test. Um, really, really useful for taking a look and, and seeing uh, at the type of content you split tested and then looking at what worked and what didn't. Then when you've sent your email, um, you can change the progress to sent and then you can input your information here. So how many clicks did it get? What was the click through rate? Um, what was the goal? So did you want to get increase in sales? Did you want brand awareness? Uh, you can select that and then you can select whether or not it was achieved or not by clicking that tick there. Then when you are completely finished, you can click the done button. And when you click the done button, it amazingly moves the card over into the done list. It adds a 
green tick to it, uh, and then it completes the goals as increased sales, uh, whatever it was, whatever you chose for your goal, and then it adds a, a tick of goal achieved if it was. Now again, you can you can jump into all of this and you can customize all of this. You can go into the uh, automations that I set up. It's super easy to do. Again, if you're not super sure about that, check out my earlier videos on automations. But overall, that board should be super helpful in creating content for your emails and, and just managing all that information and data on there. So that's it from me for this video. I hope you found the content useful and interesting and I hope you enjoy using the template. Now, if you've got any questions or you disagree or you've got any thoughts, please do leave a comment down below and let me know and I'll happily have a chat with you and we'll battle it out in the comment section of LinkedIn or YouTube or wherever you're watching this content. So thanks a lot for watching guys and I will see you in the next episode.